chat brought it home a little closer, the, uh, the, fang, the way in which Mary May received the news which she was given. I kind of carry on now by singing uh, Once in Royal David City. Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, 
The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for him in the inn. We're going to carry on by singing Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. Um, following that, uh, we're going to have the premiere of a new carol called Many Prophets Have Spoken.
I never fail to be amazed by the abundance of talent that God put in this church. If you know the story, the shepherds arrive next, and we'll read about that from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 onwards. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Somebody knows the words. Joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Wouldn't you? So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now I'm going to carry on by singing the first Noel, and after that, Nick is going to bring a short word to us. <coughs>
sort of um, admire Paul's optimism. Nick's going to bring a short word, he said. <laughs> and I'm looking at the clock and I'm thinking, hey, we're actually running a little bit behind. <coughs> so I'll bring a short word. For me, uh, Christmas is, is very much about childhood memories and as I grew up and my family and, and little things and some of the things I remember is the smell of the Christmas trees and now I go and visit our daughter's houses and they've got their little children and you walk in, the first thing you smell is, is the smell of the Christmas tree. It's all that magic around Christmas and all, all those stories and I, I don't want to come down, oh, you know, we mustn't give presents. Of course, it's great fun. Let's give all the presents we can. Let's enjoy ourselves. But it's, there are these memories. There's another memory I had as a child. That you might wonder where I'm going with this and how this relates to Christmas. Just stay with me a second. As a child, I was about, must have been about nine, I think, and it was at school, and we had art classes, which I was never very good at. But they'd bring out our pictures, and we'd have to draw our pictures. And at the end of this session, you'd give the pictures back. And then when they would finish with it, they'd put it away and start another one. The teacher came, gave me a piece of paper, and I painted a little picture from something that happened on holiday. What it was, it's a material, it's a little picture. After about three or four of these sessions, I gave it back and said, I finished. And the teacher looked at it and said, no, you can do better than that, give it back to me. And I thought, it's a bit like a friend, that's nine. But then I started to look at it and thought, well, yeah, I could do more. And I started to do more to it, and more to it. And you know, I kept painting that same picture for the rest of that school term. And by the end of the school term, the teacher was saying to me, come on, you finished, you finished. I was saying, no, no, there's more to do. More to do. <laughs> and, but what I, learned, what I learned from that, at that tender age of nine, is never to close your mind. Never close your mind to anything. There's always more behind what you first saw. And I learned that, I think, at night. Oh, I've applied it ever since. Well, there we are. But don't close your mind. There's more to what you first saw. So another story. And again, you might wonder where I'm going with this. But I'm now a little older than nine. Um, but still very much, the child is still there. If you want to know how you're doing as a personality, here's a little test you can do. You can try and remember what you were like when you were 13 or 14, and all the things you liked doing at 13 or 14. And are you doing them now? There's a thought for you. My wife will tell you that I'm still doing most of them, plus a few more besides. And I sort of have moments of sort of, uh, I, I get a fad about something, and I have a little go at something. Well, I did this year, and this year I rediscovered flies. Flying flies. Particularly um, mayflies, and I spend a lot of time crawling around with a camera taking photos of mayflies and getting my microscope out looking at mayflies. Mayflies, mayflies only live a few hours and they die. Sad. Then I went on and looked at damselflies. The damselflies are incredibly beautiful, very pretty. And I was walking down the river looking at damselflies, and I started to realize that. The nature of the river was shown by the nature of the damselflies. And this damselfly, and anyway, that's me. I got really into damselflies. Then I discovered butterflies. And so now I was crawling up and down looking at butterflies. And I discovered something quite interesting, which many of you will know, but maybe not all of you. And this will come as a thought to me. When you go in the garden, and you see different butterflies. If you see a thing with red stripes down its wings, anyone know what that's called? Red Admiral. Do you know where it came from? Yeah, it's flown all the way from Central Europe, including France. This little tiny fluffy thing, which you think wouldn't last 10 minutes, and you look at mayflies, which live for a day, and then you look at dragonflies that live for a couple of days, this is all the way across France. Oh, no. It's incredible. Then I discovered something else. There's a thing called a painted lady. Butterfly. I hasten to add right <laughs> And you know, until quite recently, we didn't know where painted ladies came from or where they went to. 
How about that? And they're quite common. I mean, they're not like you're going to see them all the time, but if you go crawling around your garden in summer, they come to your garden, or on, you may well find a painted lady. And it's the only butterfly that's found in the Arctic Circle. It's found in Iceland. People did not know where painted ladies came from. They couldn't work it out. They suddenly appeared and suddenly went. Until quite recently. How recently do you think it was that we discovered where painted ladies came from? Victorian times? Second World War? I'm going to read this, courtesy of Google. Okay, this is from Google. The secrets of the UK's migrating painted lady butterfly population have been revealed by scientists who have discovered where they go in autumn. The insect flies from the continent each summer to the UK, but experts have not known where they go from in autumn. With the help of 60,000 public sightings across Europe, including efforts by 10,000 British volunteers, and highly sensitive radar, they discovered that the painted lady in autumn flies to an altitude of over half a mile, and then flies back at 30 miles an hour to North Africa. Did you know that? I didn't. I went all over the garden looking for painted ladies, couldn't find one, it was too late, they were all gone. Anyway, it's all on Apple, not that Apple, it's all on um, Google, you can look it up. But I just want to make this point. Are you sure you know what's going on around you? Because that was completely news to me. 2009, we discovered the butterfly, what the butterfly in your garden does. Amazing. What am I building up to say? What I'm building up to say is please, please, Whatever you do in your life, don't close your mind. Don't stop asking questions. Don't stop looking. <coughs> because sometimes the most amazing things can happen. Christmas is very much a child, child's time. But it's also an adult time. It's time for us to look back and for the children to look forward. And we have this wonderful story of a baby born in a manger to a couple. Oh, we've heard it every year. Some of us for many years. Some of us for over half a century. Some of us are getting on for a century. We've heard it a long time. And it's so easy to take that story and think, yeah, I know that story. And you just say, that's it. It's that story again. It's that time of year. We can take it a number of ways. Is it the story about life and birth and the wonder of being human and the joy of having a child? Yeah, it is. And that's how many of us take it. That's as far as we go. And maybe more to it than that. For some people, it's a story about a child who was born, around whom legends grew up. He was seen as exceptional. He was seen as unusual. He was a good speaker. He taught all about peace and joy. How we can approve that is what he did. Is there more to it than that? <clears throat> I guess most of us here know something about the story of Zeus. Who was Zeus? He was the ancient god of the Romans. Ah, uh, the Greeks. The Romans nicked him and called him Jupiter. And he was a god who came to Earth. So stories about gods that come to Earth are not <coughs> new. Thor? Anybody heard of Thor? God of thunder, the god of the Norse. Norseman, another story about a god who came to earth. Uh, myth. Anybody know any ancient Egyptian gods? Aken, god came to earth. And so we got another story of a god who comes to earth. Jesus, the little baby, who was God born to earth. C.S. Lewis was the one that said the difference between this story and the others was that this one happened to be true. I can't put it any better than when C.S. Lewis put it. This one happens to be true. God came to earth in the shape of a baby. And we can just listen to that story and let it pass us by. Like many of us 
don't know about the things in our gardens. We've lost the curiosity, we've lost the wonder of what can happen and what is going on. The baby came to earth as God incarnate. Have you thought about what that means? You know, God could have sent us a whole list of laws. And many people interpret the Bible to mean just that, but it doesn't. The Bible is all about the coming of God to earth as a baby. The laws are to guide your thinking around that. He came to earth as a baby, and he gave us only two commandments. Love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Anything outside of that is an error. So when we hear people telling us as good Christians we should go and kill other good Christians because they're not such good Christians, that is not what Jesus came to tell us. He came to tell us to love one another and to love our neighbours as ourselves. The coming of a child and a person shows he didn't come to tell us how to live, he came to show us how to live. 